Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. I'm your host Scott and back with me as always is my good friend and co-host Dan. And on this week's podcast we are speaking to one of the best elite coaches in this country, Andy Manley. Yes, hey everyone, lots we could go through on this episode. We're all, or should be all, well aware of how Dan Whiffin is swimming right now and who better to speak to than the person helping him reach these amazing heights and his coach, Andy Manley. Let's see if we can get some tips and advice from him that we can all share with you guys out there. Yes, yeah, so let's have a listen to what's in store on this week's episode. So right now, the, the distance group here that I coach, I'm, I'm so fortunate to have so many good, talented athletes. And then I guess my job as a coach is to create the culture and the environment where they can flourish and, and keep getting better. And that, that's exactly what you're seeing with, uh, with Dan and, and all of them right now. And the good thing is, like, those performances in December came without us really targeting, you know, those, you know, yes, it was the end of a, a block of work, but it was very much just an aerobic block of work. You know, we'd been away at Altitudes, uh, which was really, really successful camp for us. That was the third, third Altitude camp in this Olympic cycle. That, that led to those swims, but we didn't do any real preparation for those meets. It was just right. Well, let's go and swim short course to end this block. And then he, he just, he just looked really good. He got out the warm up in Edinburgh and, and said, you know, you know, he, he he knew he was, there was something special there. So joining us on this week's podcast is the director of swimming and performance coach at the University of Loughborough, Andy Manley. Now, there are incredible performances going on in the swimming pool, like Dan said, from Daniel with him, but from many other swimmers at Loughborough University. Mm. So we're looking forward to speaking a lot about the culture that him and Ian Hume are forming there, why swimmers like... Felix Ubeck, Louise Hansen are sticking around after they finished their first round of studies. And then a mm. little bit of some parenting advice from an elite coach whose son is performing very well in the sport as well. Dan, I'm really looking forward to this podcast. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of looking forward to the end bit, actually, when he's going <laughs> to be racing his son. Uh, I think that's going to be a great story. So stick around for that. Um, but I think the majority of this podcast will be talking about Dan Whiffin because he is a bit of a superstar right now. He is very much Ireland's poster boy. So that will be where the most of the, the talking will be. Yes, so let's jump straight into this week's episode. Andy, hopefully everyone is aware of you by now with the fantastic work that's going on at Loughborough. Thank you for coming on to the podcast. How are things with you? No, very good. Thanks. Thanks for the invitation to come and speak with you both. And uh, yeah, things are good. Just come off poolside a couple of minutes ago from a good session tonight. And we're, we're a few days away from the Bucks Long Course Championships this weekend. So busy week for us preparing for that. Yeah, absolutely. No rest for the wicked whatsoever. But thank you for giving up your <laughs> evening. Um, so like I said, you're crushing it right now with the University of Loughborough squad. But how did you get to this position in your coaching career? Where did it all start for you? Well, it's, it started right back here as a, as a student athlete myself. Um, so this is where I studied. This is where I swam for, for many years. And this is where I, I got the, the intent and the, the desire to become a coach myself. So in my my final time here as an athlete, uh, you know, my final two years here while I was studying for my master's degree, I began doing my, my coaching qualifications. Not really 100% sure that's what I wanted to do, um, but sort of the, the interest was starting to take hold. And I guess I, I kind of fell into it as a job that, you know, I was right place, right time. When I graduated, a job came up fairly close to home. Uh, and I kind of thought, well, that that would be a great thing to do while I figure out exactly what I want to do with my career. And sort of 20 years later, and here I am You're now sat in. as director of swimming and not trying to figure out what I want to do anymore, just trying to do the best job I can as a coach. <laughs> How has um, oh. Loughborough changed from when you were there all those years ago to where it is now? Has there been much progression oh. in the actual, well, I presume there has in the facilities and what sort of, what is able to offer swimmers these days? Yeah, it, it, the landscape and the environment is, is totally different. I mean, when I joined uh, a long time ago now as a student athlete, I mean, the program was still held in real high regard. It was a, it was a very good team, but we swam out of a four-lane, 25-yard pool. Um, you know, the, the, there wasn't a gym as such. It was, you know, sort of like a, a PE hall with a, a little bit of equipment. Uh, and I think at the time um, when Ian Armiger was appointed uh, director of swimming, I think at that point he took over from Mike Perrybrune. And I think that both of them at the time were the only full-time coaches on, on campus. Fast forward now to the position we're in now and, and the amount of full-time staff here, both coaches and 
sports science support is is just staggering. It's so well funded. It's so well resourced as a as an organization and and that's why the results not just for swimming but all sports are, are so good mm. yeah i mean we've had felix on the podcast and he was talking about he's obviously graduated from his degree ages and ages ago but he still wants to say that because the facilities and the coaching and the i suppose the network everything is so good there but if we re- rewind a little bit more if i believe if i'm right you were the head coach at davencio for about six years is that right I was. My, my very first job out of here was uh, a club called Swindon Dolphin, so down in Wiltshire. Mm. Oh, so to, that, that was my introduction to coaching. Um, and I spent, what was I there, from 2002 to 2009. So that was a real good grounding for me. You know, it was a big club, around, you know, 400, 450 members from everything from kids in armbands starting to learn to swim through to 85-year-old master swimmers. And, you know, obviously as head coach, I didn't coach them all, but I had an involvement mm. and, a, and a responsibility for every level of the club. That led me to DaVentio, which was kind of my first sort of taste of, of working at, uh, the, you know, the higher ends, you know, albeit with age group and youth swimmers. But that's where that, that first taste of international swimming with, you know, things like European juniors and European mm. Youth Olympics... And that's where that that side of the sport, that elite end or high performance end, or uh, was the thing that really sort of ticked all the boxes for me. And that's what excited me the most. Yeah, because I kind of want to ask, like, why, how are Davencio so good? What brings <laughs> so much success there? Because you've got swimmers like Abby Wood, Imogen Clark coming out of there, Jacob Whistle come from there as well. What is the secret to the success up there? I think. You know, it was, a, it was a county performance squad or is a county performance squad. So the idea, the way it works, you know, without, uh, you know, without the support of all the home clubs, it, it wouldn't function. But what was happening was really well was you were getting people like, you know, Abbey Wood from Buxton or Molly Renshaw from Ripley Rascals. And you, you've got these mm-hmm. amazing base clubs that supported the pathway in the county. And it's mm-hmm. a bit like, you know, Nova Centurion in, in Nottinghamshire, you know, the same kind of model. And we were able to, you know, get the support of the home clubs, get the kids in from a young age, develop them uh, to the point that, you know, that I think the thing that worked really well, I guess, when, when I was there and still does is that kind of success breed success mentality. So at the time, mm. we had this whole bunch of breaststrokers at a youth level, male and female, that almost saw what each other were doing and, and raised the bar again. You know, so when Abby Wood was 11 years old, she had probably about six other international breaststrokers in the team at the time. Mm. And so that was her, they were her role models, you know, so that's was like, well, that's, they're my friends who I'm training with day and day out. And it just made it accessible for her and gave her the desire to want to push on and, and obviously become the swimmer she has done. Yeah, it's, mm. it sounds like an amazing place essentially for swimmers to grow. I think the, the list that Dan's got and there's more is endless. But mm. in terms of coaches as well, if you just look, Jamie Main has recently made the transition from there over to the Bath National Centre and you made the jump from DaVentio to Loughborough. So it, it obviously sets coaches up as well for that high performance level. Absolutely. And I, and I took over from Mark Rose, who's gone on to have a, a fantastic career in, in the city of Manchester and done an amazing job with a huge program there. So that's what attracted me to the role in the first place when Mark moved on. And I obviously knew about DaVentio whilst I was coaching in Swindon. And for me, that was a, a really high pedigree team. And so as soon as that job was advertised, that was a, you know, a, a logical step for me to go for. Obviously, you never know if you're going to get appointed, but mm. luckily I must have... Uh, come across okay in the interview and impress the right people because it was offered the position and yeah that that was a, a big stepping stone for me um, one that's really driven my you know sort of accelerated my development as a coach because what it gave me was then opportunities to get onto British junior teams and and the mm. sort of support I got from that and off the back of that I was nominated to go on to like a UK sport coaching program and all these things really fast track my development through being uh, in the DaVentio program. Yes, it, we we always talk about swimmers trying to stand out when they're age group to get onto these programs, but do coaches have to do it as well? Is it just out of interest? Do you need yeah, to like, raise your head up above the parapet? I believe so. I mean, I think one thing I think that I did at the time was try to put myself out there, you know, so whether it was Swim England level one or level two camps as they were then, you know, to get involved and be proactive, I guess, in trying to show your interest in developing yourself and your and your skills, whether that's your technical skills on pool side or your softer skills 
you know, away from poolside and managing relationships, all those sort of things. Mm. So I think that ability for coaches, and it still happens now to, to do that and put themselves out there. At the time, I felt that was rewarded. Mm. Mm. Does it come down to having like the, your one standout summer or are you then sort of judged on the whole squad as a whole? Yeah, that's, that's a good question. And I still think that one standout summer does get your foot in the door, so to speak. You know, so my first... Um, opportunity to to be a coach at European Juniors was because Molly Renshaw and, and another girl called Jody Hawksworth at the time who made it onto the team. So getting a swimmer to that level, I guess, puts your name in the mix. But then there's probably 20 coaches that are putting swimmers on teams. So I, I, so I think your question, the answer to your question is yes. Having that one swimmer just gets your name in the mix. And then it, I think what else you can do to enhance that is you know, like those proactive things, how much you're putting yourself out there and trying to develop yourself as a coach. Yeah. Mm. Now, yeah. your one standout swimmer, if we say that right now, in the water has to be Daniel Within. I think everyone in the swimming world certainly stood up and noticed him after the Scottish winter short course national mm. swim. I was poolside. The atmosphere was on, honestly unlike anything I've seen at like a winter nationals meet. Everyone was cheering him on. You had all of the elite swimmers there kind of poolside shouting him on the whole time and it, it seems like he's really ready now to break through and challenge for the international podiums kind of this summer and beyond what are your thoughts on his progress from well 2022 and now 2023 yeah I, th I think like i mentioned a few minutes ago at the show when we had that kind of success breed success it made making the step up possible because they saw it day in day out and that's happened with dan so Dan started at the same time as Felix started with us. And that was the best thing that could have happened for Dan. So we straight away, we had an environment with somebody who was already swimming really well at a world level in Felix, but has got, get, has got better since. And then you had Dan, who was this you know, younger guy who was, had swum junior internationally, but was looking to make that step forward. And so that training environment just enhanced everyone. It, it pushed Felix on because these youngsters were coming in, you know, with Will Bell start with us at the same time. He's an outstanding British athlete. But then Dan then is chasing what Felix is doing and the whole thing just heads in that upward trajectory. So that's been amazing to have that group all with us at the time. And they were joining people that were already swimming fast. So right now, the, the distance group here that I coach, I'm, I'm so fortunate to have so many good, talented athletes. And then I guess my job as a coach is to create the culture and the environment where they can flourish and, and keep getting better. And that, that's exactly what you're seeing with, uh, with Dan and, and all of them right now. Mm. Yeah, I mean, where would you say the sudden huge improvement has come from, from Dan? Has it been a long time coming? Yeah, well, I mean, his first year was great too. So when he made the T Tokyo Olympics, that was kind of like, as soon as he got in, we sat down about goals for the season and... And that was a bit of a long shot. I think his best when he came in was like 15.39 long course. Um, now, he had to work really hard to do that, but he was ambitious and he wanted, you know, and I asked him that question, you know, are you ready to do the work that's probably going to be needed to make that, you know, Tokyo Olympics? And, and it was, he didn't even need time to think about it. That was what he wanted to do. Now, Obviously, that was a great year. And then he's gone on to the last season where, you know, he, he won a silver medal at Commonwealth Games. He made the final uh, of the 800 at Worlds and, and narrowly missed the 1500 final. And so those swims in December, like the short course times, were, were spectacular. But it's he's been building momentum since the first day he got here. And so for us, the, the, you know, his teammates, the support staff here, the other coaches, it's not it's not a surprise because... We see what the guy can do day in, day out, and we see the focus and dedication, not only from him, but everyone around him that is, is pushing him onto those levels. Mm. Are you having to keep his feet on the ground at all, given that essentially now he's like Ir Swim Ireland's poster boy? Like the, the, yeah. the performances that are coming out. Is, I, I have spoken to him. I know he's a very humble guy, but he's got very high sights or, or aims. Yeah, he has, and I think that's a good thing. So, yeah, you're right. My job as the coach is to... We do want to push boundaries, but it is to keep him grounded as well. Now, th there's no big headiness, big uh, big headedness to what I'm seeing at all with him. You know, or certainly I don't I don't see that in him at all. I think he turns up day in day out, ready to work hard, and you know he's he's very open, he's very coachable. You know, so if, if we're suggesting things that are going to make him better, he wants to hear it. He's very receptive to that. Um, so no, it, it's 
the, the reining him in bit is sometimes like uh, protecting him from himself. So if we've got a session where we want it to be low level aerobic, you know, I, <laughs> I have to sort of like, you know, we use whether it's heart rate monitors or lactate testing, we, we have to slow him down sometimes oh, wow. because he's so keen to keep pushing on. Um, but then as a coach, it's like, well, how much do you slow him down if he's coping with it and he's heading down this trajectory? So the challenge for me, and I've said this to other coaches recently, is, is taking the science of coaching, the what we know and what we're getting, and mixing that with the art of coaching, you know, when to, you know, when we want to push him or when we want to suggest there's more there or try and hold him back a little bit. And it's combining those two things to, to get the performance. And so far, so good. It's working well. Um, the, the logical step now is to target a podium, you know, at a, at a world or an Olympics, but he's in an event that is absolutely stacked at a world level. Mm. You know, the, the medals can come from a whole range of people. You know, his name is in the mix now for, for sure, but getting it in onto that podium is, is going to be one hell of a job. And so we've got to keep trying to squeeze out everything we can of him technically, tactically, physically, mentally, you know, try and find mm. all those gains and then our job is to make sure that that comes together on the day. Yeah, I suppose that was kind of my next question because it's obviously putting these amazing performances short course. And so the big question really is that can he now take those performances to the long course pool? Is there any key areas that he's got to work on? Because obviously two different pools is two, it's a very different race. Yeah, and, and the good thing is like those performances in December came without us really targeting, you know, those, you know, yes, it was the end of a, a block of work, but it was very much just an aerobic block of work. You know, we'd been away at altitudes, uh, which was really, really successful camp for us. That was the third, third altitude camp in this Olympic cycle that, that led to those swims. But we didn't do any real preparation for those meets. It was just right. Well, let's go and swim short course to end this block. And then he, he just he just looked really good. He got out the warm up in Edinburgh and, and said, you know, you know, he he knew he was there was something special there. Um, and then that's my job, just to you know almost let let the handbrake off and let him go. But converting that to long course, I, I, you know, it, it sounds it almost sounds a bit like nonchalant. But I think the fact now we're going to go through this really detailed preparation phase for for the summer. Uh, you know, I, I, and barring a disaster, uh, you know, a, a big PB is, is due, you know, and it's just mm. our job to make sure we put the right pieces in place to make that happen. Yeah, it's mm. like we've spoken to him and he's he's mentioned targets like world records and stuff like that. So for for younger swimmers out there, how important is it to have this? It's almost like an unbeatable attitude. Like he knows the talent that's in distance swimming in the world right now, everyone is fully aware it's like a golden generation of male swimming. And yet there's no doubt really in his mind of how high he can go. So why is that unbeatable attitude so important to not just his success, but just success in swimming in general? Yeah, because look, you've, you've got to back yourself. I mean, the, the way he looks at it is, you know, when it comes to those races, there'll be eight, eight guys in the final, you know, and, and hopefully he's one of them. And it's, he's he, he will just back himself to you know to race race them and beat them and he and he does it every time i think back to um he raced out in berlin in october in the the world cup meet and uh wellbrock was swimming in that race and roman shook and and dan's attitude is just great he's like look i'm just i'm just gonna go with them if i want to beat these guys when it comes to the real big races i've i've got to start being in the race with them and so his attitude is look right now i might be able to hold on to them for 400 meters and then they're gone or maybe I can hold on to them to 700 meters. But the way he's going at it, his attitude is like at some point that the plan, if it works, is that he will be able to hold on to them to 1400 meters. And then it comes down to that sprint finish, which as you guys know, you know, it can go any way if you've got that desire and that hunger. So mm. I think his attitude in those early season races has been fantastic. And I think for, for younger swimmers and, and or, or swimmers of any age or any level, really, he, he's got that desire. He wants to go head to head with these people as often as he can. He wants to test himself. He wants to come out of those situations and see, right, this is what I've got to work on. This is where they're better than me at the moment. So turns is one thing. We know in the Commonwealth race, he gave so much away to the Australian guy, Sam Short, who ended up just beating him. Mm -hmm. So we've gone away from that. We've looked at the race video. We've looked at the analysis but he, he embraces that, right, tell me where I can be better. And he's so diligent at then going away and, and working with us, coaches and the support team to to develop those areas of his of his racing. 
Yeah, the mentality sounds like it's absolutely perfect from him. I mean, going back to the Commonwealth, you just brought it up. Do you reckon that was actually an important, quote-unquote, loss for him in his in his future swimming? I mean, the, the big deal with Commonwealths is that Northern Ireland aren't a nation that come away from the pool with a whole bunch of medals, mm. you know, and, mm. and and they had an amazing meet, you know, from, from the able-bodied swimmers and the para swimmers that were on the team. So I think... For Dan to win a medal of any colour was a really big deal for the Northern Irish team, and he and he knew that. I think he felt, having then got silver, I think he was like not kicking himself because he was happy. And look, the time was excellent as well. Mm. You know, it mm. was a really really good time. It would have just you know for him the icing on the cake would have been the gold medal. But yes, I think you're right to come out of those and and realise that the job's not yet done. It is still you know it, it is a good thing. But I think even if he had, Dan would then still say, right, well, what won Worlds? Well, Pantaneri did this time here, or Welbrock did this time there. He, you know, he's very, he's very much a student of the sport. He knows what's going on. He knows what times people are doing. And that, you know, so he, he's well aware of what the level is. So, um, but yeah, to answer your question, you know, if there can be such a thing as a good loss, I think that probably mm. was one that made him realise that he's made amazing progress. But there's still still work to be done. He's he's certainly not the the finished article, and nobody had ever suggested he was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. On the world stage, is he? Um, because we we've spoken before to Dan Jervis, and he said there is a very clear difference between an eight hundred and a fifteen hundred. Is, is the target primarily the fifteen over the next few years, or does he look at both? Um, that's, that's another good question. I think I think we look at both, and I think what we saw from the Commonwealth Games was his four hundred is now starting to move on. You know that was three forty six, yeah. which mm. all right, it's not in the it's not in the realms of you know even medals or finals just yet. But the fact he's showing a little bit of speed on that side is a is a good thing because you know as you know, you know if you're turning at fourteen fifty, there could be four guys in a line at you know with fifty to go. So mm. our preparation is around the eight and the fifteen. Um, okay. And so there's times like tonight where him and Felix have done the same training set. There's sessions where they're doing completely different main sets because of that, the slightly different focus. Whereas Felix is now 400 with a, with a really strong 200 and a really strong 800 to support. Whereas mm -hmm. Dan is very much 8 and 15 with a really good mm -hmm. 400 or, you know, a developing 400 to support. But no, Dan Jervis is right. There, it, it is a different race. You know, it is a different race. And I think the, the challenge we look at as well as the different preparation for those races is the ability to be able to swim a heat and a final mm. Um, mm. within that sort of 36 hour period. So that's, that's what we see the next challenge being that he hasn't done an awful lot of that. You know, worlds was worlds was good for him to do in, in the summer with the 800, but to make a, an Olympic or a world final on 1500 is really tough, but to then be able to 36 hours later to be able to go again, not only, be able to go faster, but go a whole lot faster if you want to contend. That's the challenge. And that's what we're working on really hard now over this next 18 months to make sure he's ready for that challenge. Yeah. I mean, we might have a few listeners now thinking to themselves, oh, what's the difference between 800 and 1500? Because you look at the finals, especially on the men's side, and the names are pretty much the same. All eight names are always contesting both the 800 and 1500. In your experience, what is, what is the difference between them both? I mean, ta tactically, it's a... It is a very different race. We, the way we look at it is Dan has got to be uh, a lot more aggressive on the 800s. The, you know, obviously, as you know from the times, the, you know, the, the average pace per 100 is quicker. But I think you, know, you can get into 1500s where there's a little bit of cat and mouse or sitting as a pack. You know, and then we saw it at Olympics where Bobby Fink came through and he was quite content mm -hmm. just sitting with them and then you know, went past them all down that last 50 or, or pulled away. But I think the way we look at the 800 is, and, and the, the feedback from the swimmers is they find that a lot harder. So they, they, it hurts more, the 800, because they say it's just relentless. You've got to be on the pace early and just be able to grind out 100 after 100, 50 after 50 of that, that next gear up. And so although the 1500, you know, you're going from seven minutes something in the 800 to 14 minutes something, it's their feedback is that it hurts a lot more. And so we have to be mindful of the sets we design that help them prepare for that. And so, yeah, they're, they're always saying it, it's a harder race. On the female side, interestingly, they, they say the other way around. Now, you could say there could be an argument that 
they're new events, you know, at an Olympic level. The 800 is new for the, the men. The 1500 is new for the women. But certainly in the last couple of years, that's the feedback I've had from the, the men versus the women is they find the, the step up or the step down in distance more challenging. Oh, that's interesting. I haven't actually given the new Olympics event a thought. Yeah. That's very interesting. I think we'll dig into that at another time. Um, now, you, yeah. you said kind of earlier on in the podcast, it's not just Dan as part of the squad who's doing amazingly. It is, It I think I saw in Edinburgh, it was like eight guys. The whole squad. The, the yeah. whole squad swim in the final yeah. of that meet. So have you purposely been building such a strong squad to get performances out of everyone? Yeah, yeah not, not just on the distance side, but yes, across the whole team. I mean, we, we took a... We took a strategic decision a few years back to, to go and uh, try and recruit international postgrads. You know, we, we recognised that what British women do very well here at Loughborough, in Bath, in Stirling, is that as a national centre, they, they bring in the, the, the majority of British talent to develop, which is their remit, and, that's, and they're doing a great job with that. Now, what that means is that, you know, whilst we still recruit really good British athletes, you know, some amazing people here, to, to be competing at that very top level, we had to go and do something a little bit differently. And so the university backed us with, with a, a revamped scholarship model that meant we could go out and look at people that were graduating from their degrees in, in the NC2A system, people who wanted to carry on studying at a post-grad level and, and bring them in. So like our first cohort of athletes was Felix, it was Louise Hansen and Andre Andreas Vazayos, yeah. who are three like, big names in the world of swimming. Um, and what that's done is it's, again, it's snowballed. So now we're, you know, we've now got a, a high performance squad here that I co-coach with Ian Hume, where half of the 24 athletes are, are foreign or international swimmers. Mm. And the other half are made up of really strong developing British swimmers. So that has been a conscious decision. It has been a strategic aim of ours to do that. And, and right now it's, it's paying dividends because it's enhancing everyone. Um, but that's something we take real pride in, you know, as a team that we go to something like a Scottish Nationals uh, that we did in December with 50 to 60 athletes. You know, we'll go to trials in April with 50 to 60 athletes. And we're proud of being, you know, the, the biggest senior program in Great Britain. Yeah, you say those first three athletes that were kind of the starting point for the model, they're all still there. <laughs> Do you try and keep them around once their degrees are done? Or is it literally the culture so good that they want to stay? Yeah, so a bit, a bit of both. You know, I think if they're on an upward trajectory, you know, and they're, they're really looking at the aim being long course international medals, then they know that the environment, the culture, the support they get here will help them get, get to where they need to be. Now, for everyone, that's not the right thing. So Marie Wattle from France was here. She did her undergrad uh, and stayed here until the Tokyo Olympics and then has gone back to France to prepare for a, for a home Olympics in Paris. So it's not the right thing for everyone. You know, so Marie did fantastically well for the team here, has gone back to her home nation and, and has gone on and got even faster. So that's, that's great for her. Louise has, has stayed on. So Louise is no longer a student, but is a full-time member of the team. Um, Felix and Andreas, have, although they've finished their master's, have, have enrolled on additional courses. So Felix is now studying for his PhD um, and they want to stay and study as well. So I think it comes down to the individual. Um, you know, they've still got academic aspirations. We can provide them with what they need here. For Louise, the right thing was to, to stay and swim with Ian, but not to carry on studying. And so we, we make it as bespoke as possible. We find what's right for them and, and put a plan together that, that helps them down that journey. Yeah, it's interesting because you've got a multitude of different events in your squad, one of which including open water as well. Um, as far as we know, we've done a bit of research. You can now qualify for the Olympics through the 1500 in the pool for the open water. Am I right in saying that? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So I think yeah. with a bit of speculation, it looks like what FINA are trying to do is almost grow the field of the, the, the marathon race, you know, the 10K, without adding more accreditations or more people at the, at the Olympics. So mm. it's kind of speculating a bit that that's, that's what it looks like is happening. So, yes, you're right. If if you qualify for the Olympics in the 1500 or the, or the 800 on the, on the women's side, then you can automatically get a spot in the 10K race. So I think, you know, people like Felix, uh, who's never done a 10K in his life, may decide, oh, well, you know, I'll, I'll have a go at that, which is, a, you know, it's, it's kind of funny. Um, but then alongside that, you've got the, 
the people who the open water is their main event who've got to qualify either through that means or through the regular qualification race yeah i mean how do you feel about that because it's, it's two almost two very different sports is that a, is it a good thing that you're kind of getting the pool swimmers into open water it's a good thing that the field is bigger i think the, i mm. think the the 10k at the olympics is too small when you look at most in-season races, you can have a, a really big field and then you go to the Olympics and it's, it's just tiny in comparison. Whether it's the right thing doing it through just having pool swimmers there who have no experience, like I like say with Felix, Felix could decide to do it and it will probably be his first and last ever 10K. But <laughs> yeah. could he do it for the novelty value? Now, I'm sure that's not what FINA or, or the IOC have in mind. So it, it can, it's good that the field's bigger. But I think the mechanism by what they're doing it may be a little bit flawed, in my opinion. Do you have mm. swimmers like Hector and um, Toby Robinson or Hector Pardo? Do you have them looking now and trying to target pool swims a little bit more as like a backdoor way into open water? Or are they still very much like open water is the way I want to qualify? It's, it's the well, best way it's, to get me to the Olympics. Yeah, it's interesting you say it. So what, what British women have done with their, their new selection policy for, for worlds for open water is there's now some prerequisite times you have to achieve in the pool before okay. you can even be considered for selection um so now someone like toby who's who's so well experienced his, his pbs are well inside those cuts mm -hmm. but i think for for developing future open water swimmers it, i think it's a good thing that that's been introduced so kevin rinshaw um has, has um put together this plan where uh, people have to get these prerequisite times in the pool first and i think that's a step in the right direction um so Toby narrowly missed the Olympics last time when he was swimming here in, with mm. Dave Hemmings. He missed it by a, a fraction in the 1500 mm. and then by fingertips in the open water. So he's, he's a good enough athlete that he, he will be targeting both. Mm. And I think that's a good thing. I think the evidence shows now that if you're going to be successful in open water, you have to be fast in the pool. There's no way about it. There's no, mm. you, you know, you look at the guys who are winning the medals, you've got to be quick in the pool. Mm, very interesting yeah. now you spoke about bucks kind of at the start um and obviously it's coming up this weekend um who should we be looking out for i mean our, our team will be will be strong across the board i mean i think the the, the exciting athletes are the people who who have come in as like we talked about where we've graduated they've graduated from the nc2a system so i think dan you know without wanting to put a call out now dan's setting himself a big target as he always does <laughs> For these meets, you know, he, he puts himself out and he's quite happy chatting to his teammates and, and saying, this is what I'm going to do. So he's after something pretty fast on, on Friday night in the 1500. Uh, you know, someone like Katie Deloof, who's a, a, an Olympic medalist for the USA team. She had a really successful buck short course in November and we'll be looking at, you know, get her long course racing really firing this weekend. So that'll be good. But I think, I mean, I could go through most of our roster for the weekend. The team is so strong. Where we're supported really well is through the, the, the student athletes that train with the British swimming team. So, you know, there's a whole bunch of those guys that will now join up to create this, the Loughborough University team this weekend. So I may miss someone out here, which I apologise for. People like Laura Stevens, Freya Colbert, uh, Charlie Hutchinson, Greg Butler, you know, and there'll be a whole bunch of others. Lily Booker. Um, Elliot Clogg. <laughs> yeah, you know, so you, you take those names of athletes. They're really yeah. well-known swimmers that train with the National Centre, but wear the purple tracksuit with real pride when they turn up and race for us in Bucks every year. So we're really excited about uh, what the team could do as a whole. You know, we've, we've got to target ourselves of points that the coaches want to hit. Um, and I think based on what we did in November, we're, we're on course to do that. So I think we'll, we'll rally the troops around. We'll get them excited for supporting each other. And, you know, I think it's going to be, a, it looks like a really strong weekend ahead of us. Is it easy to mesh those swimmers into the squad that aren't usually training with you? Just yeah, it is. It is. You know, I think um, you, you could, you know, you could be forgiven for saying, you know, when they swim across all these different coaches. You know, we have four coaches here within the Loughborough University team. Plus, you're adding in Dave and Mel, who are running the national centre side. So there's athletes that swim in lots of different squads. But when they turn up, we always find the support is is really good. You know, people, they all, they all get on anyway. They train separately, but, you know, they're studying on similar courses or same courses. They, they live together, a lot of them in student housing. So 
they, they all get on great anyway. There's no, there's no animosity between any groups. And when they turn up to race together, it's, it, it, although it's just a two and a half day meet, we travel up on the bus together and it's seamless. They, you know, they get on really well and are very supportive of each other. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Now, before we finish this podcast, because it has been a lot about elite swimming, but we've got you on and we've got to talk about racing your son because he is very much doing well in the age group ranks in swimming. But what was it like actually being able to be in the pool with your own son? Yeah, it was, it was, it was kind of cool. I think like the way I look at it is, you know, I spend, I spend hours and hours a week on poolside and as much as I go and enjoy watching both the kids race, you know, I can, I can pay 10 pound to sit in a balcony for 10 hours, you know, on a Saturday and 10 hours on a Sunday or, at certain meets where I can still scrape a qualifying time, I figured, well, why not? I may as well get in and, and do a race. And so it was, it was kind of a really nice moment that I think in the first weekend of the County Champs in the Nottinghamshire County Champs, there was myself, my eldest son, Austin, and youngest son, Fraser, all in the 100 fly. You know, so we were all around, you know, in the, in the sort of marshalling area together. And it was quite a, quite a nice moment, really, as a family to, to all be lining up to do that. And then that led into the... The 200 freestyle, which was two weeks later, where Austin and I actually ended up in the same heat. So there was a little bit of uh, <laughs> a little bit of uh, bragging rights to be earned. I think there was quite a bit of pressure on him, to be honest, because all his mates were like, "Oh, you can't get beaten by your dad because you, you know, you've got this slightly overweight, bald, beardy bloke, you know, lining up, <laughs> barely able to get his racing shorts on again now." And uh, but I did, I did manage to pip him. So um, I, I think. The, the days of me uh, beating him are numbered, but um, it was good fun. It was good fun. It was it was done with, in good spirits, and I think a lot of other people there quite liked it. Yeah, do you know what I we had? Um, I know he's actually going to be listening. We had a guy we used to swim with all the time, and his dad was a master swimmer who would train with us all the time. And mm. whenever they raced, I think it was at like counties, they were most likely to go head to head. It was a case of if the son beat the dad, the dad wouldn't swim that event again. So he was slowly like ticking off which ones he couldn't uh, okay. swim anymore. Yeah. It was all it was all good fun, and I think the the family rivalry between them was pretty good. It's all good fun. Mm. Yeah, 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 that's it. And you know, it's like it gives me a reason to stay in shape. You know, I get in and, and swim here at lunch times with a, a load of other master swimmers, and it you know so it keeps me fit. I, I don't like running. If I'm going to stay stay in shape, I'll get in the pool and do that. My my days of racing I thought were long gone, but you know what? I actually quite enjoyed. Well, I say that. I enjoyed the 50 freestyle. I wouldn't say I enjoyed the 200 freestyle quite as much, but I had a little sneaky look coming into the last turn and I knew I had a little lead on Austin. So uh, I knew I had him. So I was, uh, yeah, I was quite happy about that. <laughs> <laughs> Is it easy to switch from, from coach to dad, especially with Austin doing so well right now? Yeah, so we, we have a rule that, the, the, and this is for Austin and Fraser, that when they come to chat, whether that's, you know, driving home or they might see us in the balcony, that they, they have to choose whether they want feedback from, from dad or from coach. And now, obviously, I'm not the coach, but sometimes they want to know what I've, I've thought. So, you know, what I would say to them is you, you've got to decide. So they, they decide whether they want dad to give them the feedback, in which case it's like, you did great. I love you. Proud of what you've done. Have you had fun today? You know, the normal sort of stuff that's going to just be positive reinforcement after racing. Or do you want feedback from me as a coach? In which case, you know, I can tell you a little bit about what I thought. I'm really careful that I try not to, you know, I don't want to undermine the coach who's doing the job with them because, you know, I, that's, that's not my place to give them different uh, information on what the coach is doing. And so I try and take a, a, a step back where possible. But, you know, if we're driving home and they want to know about what I thought, when they make the decision and then I give them the feedback based on the, whichever option they choose. And it varies. Mm. Is there oh, any question? Yeah. Is there any communication with their coach now? Essentially have, have you guys ever formed a plan between the two of you, or how two coaches could work? No, I mean the challenge we have where, where Austin's at an age now where he, you know, he, he needs to, or they're starting to look at doing morning training and things like that. It's really tough when I'm here coaching my group at the same time of day. Uh, and just the, the, the role my wife does in the police, that makes that really difficult. And so I think going forward, there may be some challenges there to perhaps overcome in terms of how we, we do the best for him without it impacting on, on what we're trying to do career-wise as well. Um, but no, I, I, I try where possible to leave the coaching to the coaches, and I, I don't want to be the person that's interfering with what they're trying to do because I think that's disrespectful. 
I'd have got annoyed about it myself as a coach coming mm. through at Swindon and DaVenture if people were doing that. Now, there's times mm. we have conversations, but I think where they're really good, the coaches there, you know, they'll, they'll talk to me as though I'm a, a swim dad, you know, even though they, they know what I do. But I think, you know, and I, so I've got a lot of respect for what those coaches do, both at, at Nova and at Bramcott Swimming Club, where the boys swim as their home club. So I think the coaches at both programs there do an amazing job. The boys are happy with what they're doing. And so with that in mind, I, I try and take a, a step back. I try and take a back seat. You know, I'm not there leaning over the balcony, yelling at them or far from it. You know, there's times where if I, you know, I do take them swimming of an evening. I'm quite happy sitting in the cafe and writing my session for here, Loughborough, for the next morning rather than being the person sat in the balcony sort of scrutinizing what's going on. So we put our trust in those guys to, as coaches to do the best job for them. And, and the, the kids are loving, loving swimming right now. I think that's a really good message for parents listening to take away. I really it's do. The most important thing, as long as they're enjoying it, it's clearly working as well. So yeah, can't moan about it too much, can you? <laughs> no, that's right. I mean, look, I, I had this thing once we had kids. It's like, right, the one thing they're not getting into is swimming. I, I was adamant <laughs> from the start. So they're not going to be swimmers. We, I spend too much time doing swimming. Now, so oh. we, we put them through lessons because we're like, well, they've got to learn to be safe for when we go on holiday or whatever. And then I'm sat here now and it's like, you know, several years later and, and we're spending every every weekend possible. And I think, what, what have I done wrong here? But yeah. as you say, they enjoy it. That's, that's the main thing. They, you know, they've, they've got a great friendship group there. And if they're doing that, then as a parent, you're, you're kind of happy and you feel they're on the right track. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Andy, this has been a wonderful podcast and we usually finish with some quick fire questions for our coaches. How does they sound to you? Yeah, let's give it a go. Uh, so what is your favorite stroke to coach? Um, so I would have previously said breaststroke, but based on the last few years, I've got to say freestyle now. Uh, who is your swimming idol? Oh, my goodness. Um, I guess when I was coming through as, as a swimmer at that time, someone like Mark Foster was somebody I would have always looked up to. So me as a swimmer would, would say Mark Foster. Um, yeah, so let's stick with that. Uh, what is your proudest moment in swimming so far? Um, I tell you, well, I'd say so far probably would have been Felix winning the world short course 400 freestyle title because I think that came off the back of what we would consider a disappointment at the Olympics, finishing fourth and and being so close to a medal. Sort of mm. bounce straight back from that to to world short course. Although it's you know it's not the the long course medal we're striving for. I was very proud the, the character he showed and the, the guts he showed to just stand up and get the job done there. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, what is the hardest set you've ever given out in training? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, we did a few in the run-up to Worlds last summer when we were out on training camp. Um, it would be quite complicated for me to explain it all now, but <laughs> sa safe to say we were getting like lactates of like, you know, 18, 19 millimoles out of swimmers that are, middle distance and distance focus so there was some you know there was a, a lot of pain in the pool but yeah it would be it'd be quite a complex you know i'm not a coach that just writes six 100s max it, there's usually a little bit of bits and pieces this and that within the set mm. um but yeah there's there's some sets that are certainly high lactate producing sets that are, are bringing the best out of them I can imagine. Mm. Um, and final question. It's a little bit away from swimming, but it helps all of our listeners get to know you that little bit better. If you go on a road trip, there's three spaces in the car. You can take friends, family, celebrities, dead or alive, anyone you like, who would you take with you? It's a bit of a cop out, but I am for, for me as a, as a coach and as a person, fa family is the most important thing to me. Um, you know, and, and the, and the commitment in what we do as coaches, you know, being away on all these camps and competitions. So for me, spending time with my family is, is time I really hold really precious. And so I would, I would choose my, my wife and my two kids to, to do that with me. And I know it's a cop out, but, um, I don't, I, I don't think it's cop out at all. Yeah. I, I think that, <laughs> that, 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 that shows you as the person. I think that's exactly what that yeah, exactly. question needs to be answered. Like essentially. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Andy, well, it's been a great talking to you. Fabulous work that is going on at Loughborough University. It's there for everyone to see. Best of luck at Bucks this weekend when this podcast goes live. And um, mm. looking forward to more incredible performances from the whole squad, not just Dan. I know we've spoken a lot about him, but from the whole squad for the rest of this summer and beyond. No, thanks very much. Thanks, Scott. And thanks, Dan, for having me. 
Yeah, I mean, I'm just going to echo everything that Scott just said. Best of luck for, for Bucks, and uh, thank you for joining us on the, the, the episode this week. Yeah, absolute pleasure. So, Dan, a fantastic talk with a man who is leading what I'd say is the strongest university squad to me in the world. I'd, I'd be like the Arizona University squad's doing pretty well with Leon Machard, but when you look at the depth that is on offer at Loughborough University and the success that both Andy, who we've just spoken to, and Ian Humer putting on the show right now, I think Loughborough's up there as one of the best centres to go to in terms of swimming in the world. And it's fantastic to hear that they are purposely building a strong squad. Yeah, actually, that's one thing I was going to bring up, that usually, like with Gary Humpage last week, he kind of enjoys the the kind of quick turnaround of all these swimmers, you know? Um, Whereas Andy, he actually wants to keep them involved in the programme for a sustained period of time, like Louise is still there, Felix Mm. is still there since since the beginning, and they're getting results from it. Um, Yes, we spoke about a lot about um, Dan Whiffin, and probably rightly so, because he's on fire right now. and my biggest takeaway, I suppose, was his mentality. Mm. The fact that he just seems on a different level. That This this is the reason why he's getting so much success, because he's got all this confidence. He works so hard by the sound of things, almost too hard. <laughs> um, but this <laughs> is the reason why hear, he's... Actually. Yeah, and this is the reason why he's getting the times he is and getting the medals, and that's why he wants to go a world record, and he believes he can, which is... I mean, I'd love to see it. That'd be incredible. <laughs> I mean, I didn't bring it up on the podcast, but actually when you've got swimmers like Felix and Louise Hansen saying they want to stick around, they want to do further studies or Louise is finished with her studies and she wants to stay yeah. there. When you've got swimmers of, they are Olympic gold medal quality. When they want mm. to hang around, they could have any offer from any swimming squad in the world to go to, really. The world, They'd yeah. have their picking. You are doing mm. something right when... Not just the performances that Dan Whiffin's doing, but when you're building that culture of getting these swimmers to stay, Mm. I think that, for me, that's almost a bigger takeaway than the performances of Dan Whiffin in the pool. When you've got swimmers like those two stars staying around, wanting to stay there for their swimming careers, that is what is building at Loughborough University. And that just goes. That's full credit to Andy and the team of what mm. they're doing. And obviously, it's, they're gonna they're gonna do well at Bucks this weekend. I imagine left. Yeah, we we do. didn't need to bring it up too much, really. We didn't. I, I thought <laughs> I thought I'd stick it on a get a little bit at the ends just because it's at the weekend. But uh, he's doing a fantastic job by our sound of things, and it's only going to get better. Um, mm. I wanted to bring up a little bit about the open water side of things at the end, just because I thought it was interesting that you can now qualify for the Olympics through the pool to get to the end water, which still don't quite to get me it. finds yeah I don't really get it and Andy doesn't look like he gets it much either um, but it's another it's another sort of stepping stone for someone like Hector or or Toby to, to make the Olympic team but mm. yeah it's a really, really interesting podcast I thought yeah so many messages from the mm. performances of Dan Whiffin from building a an elite squad culture to messages mm. for being a parent Dan <laughs> yeah. I could yeah. like uh, imagine getting the chance to race your two sons or be, be at the same competition. That'd be so, that'd be so cool. And the, the fact that uh, he's able to separate it out, I think that as a coach, maybe you find that really hard because obviously it's you just, your profession. You're trained in it. It's, it's like me, yeah. architecture. If someone gave me their house plans, I would struggle not to comment. But actually, yeah. he's got a step back. He's, he really appreciates that. And maybe the fact that he's gone through that journey, that progression of coaching age group squads, he knows... Mm an interfering parent is not what's needed. Um, and no, this is an elite that... coach who has a valuable opinion. Yeah, and I think that's probably the biggest takeaway is that let the coach be the coach, even though Andy is one of the best coaches in this country. He is not Austin's coach. Mm. That's that's someone else's job. He is not interfering. Yes, I know he gives them a choice of saying, do you want me to be dad or do you want me to be coach? And we'll talk about your race. Um and it's interesting that the 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 answer usually varies. Yeah, but he's not overbearing. The good the swimmers. No, no. He, like he said, he doesn't shout from the stands or anything like that. He is. He just he just wants to support their swimming, which is just you know praising as much as possible. Which is the biggest takeaway. Don't be. He's not a pushy parent, even though Austin is doing really well right now. But really well. he's just really letting well. them. He's just letting them enjoy it. That's what the biggest takeaway is. Yeah, absolutely. So that just about rounds up this week's episode of the Propulsion Swimming Podcast. We are going to be back next week reviewing the Bucks competition that is happening in Sheffield this weekend with a star swimmer from the Loughborough University squad. More will be revealed next week. But if you haven't subscribed already, please do so on our new YouTube channel, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts. And me and Dan will see you in seven days time. 
Yeah, thank you for listening, everyone, and we'll catch you on the next one. You've been listening to the Propulsion Swimming Podcast with Scott and Dan. We want to thank you for joining us and invite you to subscribe to the show as well as checking out the Propulsion Swimming YouTube channel for weekly tutorials and videos to get your swimming fix. We will be back next week. Until then, we'll catch you on the next one.